Hey humans, how's it going? Susan Ruth here. Thanks for listening to another episode of Hey Human Podcast. This is episode 158, and it was recorded last summer. I went to Louisville, Kentucky to sit down with Evander Holyfield, which, by the way, is episode 118 from August 16th, 2018, for those of you that want to go back and check it out. And while I was there, uh, I met the promoter for the event that was going on when I spoke with Evander, uh, this guy, Chris J. And Chris said, hey, uh, if you want to talk to some other folks, there's some really interesting people around here. And because of that, I was able to have a conversation with Al Snow, the WWE wrestler. That's episode 146 from April 28th of this year. And then I also talked to Will Temple, uh, a boxing coach, uh, and that episode was 136 from December 20th last year. Uh, anyway, that is to say, so Chris J was really wonderful. I introduced me to so many people. And one of the people he introduced me to is a guy named James Dixon. And that's which episode this is. James uh, owns and operates TKO Boxing. And what I really enjoy about James's story is that he absolutely gives back to his community. Uh, He saw a need for kids to have a role model and an outlet. All the things that teenagers angst about, he saw a way to channel and funnel that energy into something positive. And so this nonprofit gym, TKO, which again is in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, provides that space for, for the youth of the town. And they don't have to pay anything. It's fully funded by donations and uh, it gives kids something to achieve, which as we all know is very important in development, self-esteem and the like. So James was very kind enough to bring me into the gym and sit down and chat with him. We covered a ton of topics Really, really interesting guy, and he's, right now, they're currently uh, doing a reboot on all the website stuff, so unfortunately, uh, I don't have that information to give, but please keep an eye on the Google for TKO Boxing Louisville, Kentucky, for ways to donate to to them, because I think it's a very worthy establishment. I think James is doing really wonderful work. Uh, he and the other coaches there. Uh, just as a side note, James's son, Carlos, is an incredible boxer. I was able to see him fight when I was in Louisville. <laughs> he knocked out the opposition in, I believe, 31 seconds. T- uh, total knockout. So I think that, I don't, I don't think that's very common. Um, I'm not a huge follower of boxing, but I, uh, I know that that was very quick. It, incredibly powerful kid, young man, young adult, really, I guess at this point. Yeah, so I'm excited for this episode. Uh, it's been a minute since we did it, but it's everything is still quite relevant. And again, please keep an eye out to, to donate to TKO Boxing when they have all that stuff up and working. Um, as nonprofits go, it's sometimes hard to get all the ducks in a row uh, as far as the websites and things, as I know a lot of you know. Speaking of websites, heyhumanpodcast.com has got the links page and information about guests. And of course, you can listen to the podcast on there. But really, it's the links page that I'm proud of because it's got a lot of really great information, books, movies, articles, all sorts of stuff. So if you find yourself vegging out at work or bored one day, it's a great place to go spend a bunch of time because there's so much information on that page. Um, If you shop at Amazon, please do so through the Amazon portal that's on the front of Hey Human Podcast's website. Uh, It helps support Hey Human and helps keep it ad-free. So uh, every little bit helps. You just shop Amazon like normal, but through that portal, and it gives a little bit back to Hey Human. If you find yourself with an extra moment, please pop over to iTunes and rate and review Hey Human. I'll appreciate you even more than I already do, which is a lot. Uh, social media, Hey Human Podcast on Instagram and Facebook, and then my personal 
uh, social media is Susan Ruthism, S-U-S-A-N-R-U-T-H-I-S-M. And that's Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. That's a lot of stuff I'm keeping track of. But you know what? It's okay. Um, you can email me, Susan, at HeyHumanPodcast.com. And uh, I also have a website, SusanRuth.com. That's my personal site. It's got... Uh, access to my music that I write and uh, keeps people in the loop of performances and all that kind of thing. So definitely check that out too. I spent the last week here in Seattle studying improv with David Rosowski, actor, director, writer, extraordinaire. Uh, he has a podcast that I want to plug called ADD Comedy. Uh, he was on my podcast. It was episode 123. It's a really a fun one. He's a very interesting guy. So I want to throw that one out there too for you to perhaps go back and listen to an oldie but a goodie. And I think that's about it. I still haven't seen Endgame. Not happy about that. I hit the road again today. I'm heading towards San Francisco. Uh, I've got some cool people to sit down and converse with there. Really excited about those conversations and can't wait for you to hear them. I don't know what next week's episode is going to be yet, so you will be surprised like I am going to be surprised when I pick it. <laughs> so have a wonderful whatever you're doing, and uh, here we go. James Dixon, welcome to Hey Human. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Technically, we met already, but yeah. still, this weekend. So this weekend, yeah. So tell the fine folks what you do. I am a boxing coach slash father figure mentor. That's, not in the George Michael kind of way. No, no. <laughs> in the um, sense that uh, I seen, I got tired of coming home. I worked in, I was a blue collar guy, had a construction company. A couple of years back, my son came to me. Um, he, he was trying to find his way. I was uh, traveling quite a bit with work and he started to kind of lose his focus and his way in school mm -hmm. and I thought he had too much idle time so um, I told him that he needed to pick a sport so I told him he had a week to decide so he came back and said he wanted to box Now we had already played basketball and football and he just wasn't, he didn't draw a lot of interest to it. He was a skateboarder kind of guy, you know? So he said he wanted a box, and I said, you sure about that? He said, yeah. I said, so whatever you're gonna do, we're gonna stay focused for one year, and we're gonna see it through. So, at first, my goal was to send him to another coach, but as I was there as his father, being a fan and, and being around boxing quite a bit, um, I noticed some things and I had spoke up in a gym and then a coach said, look, there's only one coach here. So I thought about that. After practice, I took my son home and I said that I could do that. And me and my son started training as boxing. I started studying a lot more, traveling. And um, me and my son got closer through this because of the hard work that's involved with boxing. Um, over time, we started traveling and he started winning tournaments. And the next thing you know, uh, kids in the neighborhood and from his school said, we want to do that. They started seeing the change in my son's body. He started getting muscles and shredding up. And next thing you know, there's kids at my house wanting me to train them. And I thought about it, and I said, nah, I think, you know, I'm just going to stick with my son. And then eventually it just wore on me. They were sitting around every day, and I got uh, parents to sign some waiver forms, got with an attorney. So I turned a two-car garage into a gym. That's awesome. Yeah. And then, you know, the only, the only thing was they had to come to the gym. They had to show up Monday through Friday. And they had to keep their grades up in school. Mm -hmm. That was just part of the deal. I'm going to train you for free. The trade back to me is you got to keep your grades up in school. And I noticed that most of these young men that were coming to my gym, they were coming from single parent homes. Mom's out working and dad's gone for one reason or another. And uh, 
I thought that there would be a tremendous need. And as I'm doing this, every night I turn on the news and you see these young guys out in the street, most of the guys uh, that I see, I seen in my neighborhood was getting shot and killed mm -hmm. for drugs or various gangs. And so I said, well, I thought through the discipline of boxing that we could make we could make um, we could make a difference if we got kids off the street, uh, got them some discipline. So that's where we came up with Louisville TKO Boxing, which is a nonprofit here in Louisville, Kentucky. And through that, we've uh, we've helped many kids get them off the street, turn them around. Uh, I learned in my youth: the younger you get kids exposed to different things the more productive they become in society mm -hmm. because most kids and most people I call it boxed off where you don't uh, if you live in the suburban you kind of stay suburban if you're in what most people would call the hood you kind of stay in the hood and you kind of stay around people that you're comfortable with your tribe yes absolutely but at a younger age if you can break that and get kids exposed to other kids i mean if you take kids young kids and you put them in uh daycare they'll all get along and play together all day long there will be no difference. They're just playing. Mm -hmm. They're not looking at one another different uh, as far as their ethnic uh, background or whether they're... It's a great equalizer. It's a great equalizer. But as they grow up, then parents... Mm -hmm. Put their shit on them. Put their shit on them and pollute them with their bullshit. And they mm -hmm. want them to be more or less kind of like them you, you you know i i want my kids to just be productive and do something you know to make a difference well that is like you <laughs> <laughs> well I it, what you mean though. <laughs> absolutely it's it's like me but not all the way like me i mean parents oh today we you know even our parents wanted us to do something better or greater mm -hmm. than of them course. I mean, that's a and wish you kind of you you do that yeah you know but um it's it's uh you gotta kind of let them find their way though you know and my my childhood was different because you know i was uh i didn't you know it's crazy just meeting you the other night i was explaining to you that you know i was adopted I was adopted and I didn't see my mother or father ever, you know, and just recently I was fortunate enough to meet my biological brothers and sisters. How old were you when you were adopted? 13. And so you were almost aging out of the system. Were Absolutely. you in foster care? And yes. I'd, I'd been in foster care and then I ended up uh, with the Dixons that adopted me and they were much older so in this time it's changed a little bit but back then with their age being so different they had to wait till I was a teenager to say that I wanted to be a Dixon and I remember the day mm -hmm. very very clear uh, it was emotional for them and me and uh, you know I'm kind of a product of them to an extent mm -hmm. you know my parents uh, they were just good people you know they they raised a lot of kids I've seen a lot of love but then you see uh, things that still affect me to the day you know I can remember as a kid coming home and you see a certain car you just know look most kids don't pay attention to a license plate when I was young I knew that if you seen the license plate and it had stayed on it we knew that we had someone was leaving that day there was an anxiety that kind of came over me and you would sure enough you come in the house and there's kids crying mm -hmm. because they don't want to leave um, I remember it 
I remember it. Uh, I don't even think about it much anymore, but I know that it affects me. Uh, kids that were my brothers and sisters that over time, they're your brothers and sisters. And then you come home and then they're screaming and crying to stay and they're being you know they're being sent off and that affected me at a young age like I just knew that I wanted to be a great parent uh, now there's no instructions on being a great parent you know uh, I haven't done well in relationships uh, but I know that I've gotten better I've grown over time but I do care about people I love people I don't meet a stranger and um, this game of boxing back to my son training and these young men that were coming from single homes and, and young ladies I could relate to them mm -hmm. uh, they can relate to me because you know I've been fairly successful in life I've worked tremendously hard and that's what my adopted parents gave me they gave me a spiritual belief and a work ethic and they just said, be somebody. You know, uh, my dad drove a garbage truck for civil service in Fort Knox, Kentucky. And he was a man. And I was, I'm, a, I'm very proud of him. You know, he was noble, he worked hard, people respected him. And he just said, no matter what you do, you just, you just do it well. You show up old school. Yeah, and it's hard to find men. Yeah. these days and and women in some regards yeah. too it's i think we're so we're ha i think in general human beings are having an identity crisis because we've lost communion because we're so involved in all of our computer devices that certainly have their benefits and are important but they take away from this the connection right. of the being and when you lose sight of who who you are and who i am in a, in that communion eventually you're going to lose sight of who you yourself are because you have nothing to mirror from. Absolutely. And you, that it goes back to what you're saying with uh, the devices. We have garbage going into kids' heads 24-7. Mm -hmm. Phones have such an effect. These devices have such an effect on uh, the kids today where back in the day, if you got in an argument or had a disagreement with a guy in school, they depart you. You had time to go home, cool off. The next day, you could probably talk it out. But today, you have everyone else throwing gas mm -hmm. and wood on the fire, if you will, and they never have that separation. Mm -hmm. I work 104 East Breckeridge. You just came to my gym. I'm here in Louisville, I'm, I'm, where the gym sets, it's, it's been hard hit with drugs and gangs and violence. And a lot of the kids here, you have kind of the blind leading the blind. You have most of the kids in my gym come from single family homes. Uh, moms are struggling with substance abuse or their father or their grandparents are raising them. Mm -hmm. And I've just statistically learned that these phones, I mean, kids have literally got killed over beef, as they call, back and forth on a phone and led to one getting shot. And it's hard to wrap your head around that. It's hard to wrap your head around that, even today. It's, and, and another thing is the fact that you have parents that, um, there's there's they're not they're still kids themselves they they've never grown you know it's kind mm -hmm. of the blind leading the blind and i thought i would come here and make a difference uh, i think i have i've i've gotten kids that came in a program we work with right turn that's a that's a nonprofit organization in town i've worked with juvenile courts uh talk to the mayor we've got some we've got some groups different groups in town that i work with but we have kids that are coming that's came in here and we've got some that's going to school now, going to college that they're the first 
first in her family ever. You and know, you like, require a GPA maintenance a, and all that. I have a 2.5 and a real, a true 2.5, not a school 2.5, a true 2.5. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, there's kids that's coming in here that's in that's freshman in high school and they are reading at a sixth grade level, but they're in a high school. No I mean, kid left behind. Yeah. yeah. Well, they're not leaving them behind. They're just pushing them through. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's, that, that's We're the, not going to that leave is, them. That's the problem with that initiative is no kid left behind. Well, okay, fine. Then actually teach them before you let them. So we have kids. I, I when I was in college, for example, um, I tutored the football team. In English yeah. and these guys they all got full ride scholarships to college and and all that but they they could barely read or write and yeah. and that's to me that's using someone the college is using them to to get a win but where is where is the loyalty to the, the life of the guy when he graduates there is none and that is so messed up yeah, you don't set you setting them up more or less for failure. If you would have those programs and really worked in school, hey, look, school isn't for everyone. It's everyone's not, fun. not gonna. I hate it. It's not fun, <laughs> and it's look. Everyone's not going to be a school teacher yeah. or a banker, but a trade. They have to learn a trade, and most of them do. And it's, I tell the guys here in school that you know the biggest game you're going to play. It's not a game, and it's life. You know, you have a football, basketball is a very short time. You know, maybe three, four, five years of your life. Then you have another 40 years if you're lucky. You have to, I'm, I'll prepare kids to be winners in and outside the ring. And that's with being around more guys like myself. I'm, I'm a high school graduate. I, I've never been to college. I went to University of Hard Knocks, mm -hmm. but I worked extremely hard. The kids today feel so entitled. Nobody wants to work. Nobody wants to work. But that starts at home. Mm -hmm. That starts with values, ownership, looking in a mirror every morning when you brush your teeth and understanding that, hey, I'm a man, I'm a woman, I have responsibilities. I have to work. Nobody owes you anything. And I think that's the biggest, that's the biggest hurdle we have, I think, in this country, in this generation. A lot of it is just the garbage they're putting in their hands again back to the devices the and the music. food and the i mean there's it's a lot of garbage in garbage out unfortunately yeah and but it, that's that's crazy when you when you this game that i do boxing uh there is no there's no other sport that is more true to life than the game of boxing because you have to eat right you have to get your sleep. You have to work extremely hard. And no matter how talented you are, you can come in a gym some days and spar, and you're just not having a good day. And a kid you know you should be having your way with, but he's having his way with you. How do you deal with it? You're going to pout. You're going to cry. You're going to quit. You have to deal with it. You have to work through it. Kids today, they don't work through it. They pick up a gun. They pick up drugs and but if that's all they're seeing and hearing then that's all they resort to and it goes back to again what i was talking earlier the younger you can expose kids to different things the arts music different cultures the more successful they will become and and productive is it hard for you to be the pied piper in that direction when they have such so many other distractions in the real world to them, the world that they come from? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we go back to school with the tutoring. We have them in school. They have them in school for, what, six, seven hours. I have them here at the gym for an hour and a half. So, well, that's eight and a half hours. There's 24 hours in a day. Seven days a week, times, that, times a month. We have them for a short time. Mm -hmm. Then you have teachers that are underpaid, mm -hmm. You have teachers that uh, have too many in a classroom, their workloads are tremendous. And what have we done in our country? We haven't done a damn thing to fix education. I mean, our phones, think about, think about our phones just in 10 years, how our phones, their computers are in our hands, but you walk in a school and fuck, they look like they did when our parents went. Mm -hmm. Not nothing's changed. So how? In some how, cases, they have the same so, books. <laughs> so so yeah. So how can we compete 
how can we compete with yeah. the rest of the world when our education system is it's, it's not only broken it's outdated it, you know other other schools and countries are riding in ferraris we're still in uh, a model t mm -hmm. we really are mm -hmm. so that's number one you have to make school fun to these kids they're on phones and they're all over the world then you go to school and you're reading the same look you said the same book that we read when we were in school i mean it's just common sense it's common sense stuff but we keep voting these dumbasses in office well they don't really i think many politicians and i'm going to go with across the board really just care about themselves. They go in under the pomp and circumstance of patriotism and helping the world, but then they get a paycheck of 250 grand and they get to go have their martini lunches. That's not to say they're not all like that. I know there are a few outliers that are like, no, we must change stuff, but the overwhelming majority. Can, can, you know, and it's just, well, that's the whole country. You know, if you're gonna go there, you gotta go back to, it's such a red blue, Thing and and it's our country it's our country it's all of us that's being affected mm -hmm. it's just not the red it's just not the blue yeah. we're all paying the price for this mm -hmm. why it's just common sense I mean why you know and when you watch debates we're so far apart how can one person see something and the other person see something completely different when we're listening to the same conversation ah but see there it is we don't listen to each other all we want to do we're just waiting for the moment when we get to say something and nobody ever hears anything nobody gives space and allows something to sink in you know what i mean yes I and do. so without that space and to actually look we might come to the table and have a 180 opinion from each other but if all we're doing is waiting to jump in and say why we're right or what we know, there's n there will literally never, ever be a, a coming together. Absolutely. And I agree. I agree a thousand percent. That's pretty sad that uh, I j you just sit and you watch year in and year out. You know, a lot of people talk. <laughs> Talking gets nothing done. Uh, I know that I'm trying. I'm trying to make a difference. But I believe that one person does make a difference because I every child that you encounter and and change their life or they are willing to step up and change their lives because it is it's 50 right. 50 they have to be willing to and, and be active right. in their own life but um, that ripples out right like you were saying their friends see them or even family members or yeah yeah it's it, it's it's got a powerful effect I you know it's uh it's very ironic. I'm, you know, we talk about education, and you know, again, I've only went through high school, and uh, life happens. But I worked, you mm -hmm. know, just simple things. My dad just said, James, if you just dress up and show up, you you're better than half half the people. And then I look over my life, and I've dressed up and showed up, and I took advantage of every opportunity, and I'm sitting here today talking to you. You know, I mean, things, I, I don't believe in luck. I believe we create our own luck. You know, that's why it says all hustle, no luck. That's life. You just have to get out. Every, whether you're red, blue, black, white, we all want better. We all want affordable income. Yeah. We can take care of our family. Uh, we want a piece of the American dream that we call it. Everyone wants that. Everyone wants that country was founded and built on that, where we were the home of the free and the home of the brave. But some people quite are free because we live in an economic prison, you know. And some people, uh, they they don't they don't feel that they are a part. They don't feel that they will ever ever have a voice or a say. I, you know, it's very sad for me. I, you know, I, I do this, and I've had up to 105 kids, and I see kids coming in here, tatted up, hardcore, and then after four or five months of every day, you know, I, I would be tough on them. See, and I've, I've been very lucky in life to have this gift where I know the kids that I can be harder on than the ones you just got to put your arm around and talk to. 
I don't know how I do that. But some of the kids I know in here, I just gotta beat, I gotta get on them. And you can see in three months the change where they used to come in and they had a chip on their shoulder where they come in, they jump the rope and they're laughing, they're cutting up, their guards down, they're, they're, they're having fun. And I look around and you know, the sad part about it is when I look around, I see about 40, I see about 17 of those hundred that's going to truly make it, that's really going to be productive and make it. Because if you look across the country, life happens, you know, life is, you know, is going to happen, you know, and, and that's, that's the sad part. The sad part about it is half of the kids, they change so often because they're moving or something tragic happens to a family member like their cousin gets shot or something crazy like that and people listen to this and probably go man that's just that's ridiculous but it's I didn't come up around that I grew up in a small town you know Upton 67 miles south of here from Louisville but I'm a Louisvillian and uh it's different. It was different. I wouldn't trade my life for that. A lot of people go, well, you know, your life was hard. I've been dealt different cards and different hands, but there was something within me that I just refused to uh, lay down or lose. I just felt that I feel there's a purpose. I feel there's a calling to, to make a difference. You know? Did you have that resilience when you were a kid? Yes, and, I and felt it as a kid. I knew when I was, and this is no joke, I was nine years old, and I knew that there was great things ahead. I had nothing. I had absolutely nothing. Did uh, you have the, the plastic bag that foster kids always have with all the stuff in it? <laughs> Yeah, it's most, like the yeah. image of foster children is the black yeah. plastic garbage bag. Yeah, you know, I I um, I remember um, a kid, Billy Carter. Maybe I shouldn't have said his name, but this kid, Billy, and I can bleep out that. Yeah, uh, he. Um, we we were we we were in foster homes together for like four years, and I always wondered. I can remember the day he left. And I can remember Herman and this other kid that was there and left. And both of those guys ended up in prison. Both of those guys. And then, you know, I often wonder, I often wonder how it was different for me. And I read a lot and I'm trying to figure out why there's a conscious there was something conscious with me where you knew right from wrong and everybody knows that you just want to do I don't know just you want to do the right thing it just feels better it feels better to help somebody even though I can, can remember growing up in a smaller town and you know I was probably there was probably only four you know, black kids in the whole school and my graduating class of probably 400, 300. There was probably three African-Americans that graduated. And I can remember people and even teachers saying things that I knew was ridiculous. Things like? Uh, you know, just, uh, I, can, I can literally I'm old enough where I can remember a football coach. We were on a bus one time, and it was after a game, and we had just gotten ran all over by two running backs. And the coach said that on the way back, where they were talking, and he said, "Well, the reason why I can't," and this is a true story. I swear to God, this is a true story. Reason why. African American kids are more athletic is because their parents let them, you know, just run, jump all over the furniture, run through the house. There's, you know, and 
I can, I'll never forget on a bus, a friend of mine, Mike, he goes, shit, go to Aline Dixon's house and try that shit. <laughs> Uh, you know, my mom was like huge disciplinary. Yeah. Things were tight, and I think that's why I'm the way I am today. My mom, you know, my my mom was much older, and I had to learn how to cook. I'm, which I'm a very good cook too, so I can cook. My mom taught I me how to cook, man. and my dad taught me how to work and just kind of be respectful, and um, it's carried me. It's carried me. Now, have I been perfect? Am I flawed? Absolutely. And that's where I think these kids that I help here and a lot of the guys that I train, when it gets right down to talking about life, I can really talk to them about things. And people genuinely know when people are full of shit, full of shit, bullshitting them, you know, and kids can look and know that I'm not. Kids really know. I'm, oh, kids know for sure. They know. You know, and some of the kids that come in here off the bat, they're not going to get along with me because they know that they're not going to be able to run that bullshit by me. So they instantly, they don't last long here. It's it's not for everybody. Yeah. You know, I I hate that. Human beings have an element, in some cases, strong element of self-sabotage that can be overwhelming. Yeah. So you ask why you're different than those other two kids that you grew up with, and it's that's why. Mm. Yeah. Because some people, I think, are resigned to what they think they're supposed to be. Like, we're born, and there's constantly people telling us who we are. And unless you have some tiny piece of yourself where you say, that's, that's not who I am. I know who I am, and it's not that. If you don't have that little voice and you just believe whatever somebody tells you, like that coach, then you're kind of already right. at odds with the world. No, absolutely. And, you know, that coach to this day, he, uh, we, we speak. He's... Do you ever, do you, have you ever said anything to him about that? No, I'm, I, I'm I, intend, I intend to see him and in private, you know, ask him if he remembers that conversation. Mm -hmm. I'm quite sure he won't, but I can tell you, I have a great memory. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> that was something that, there was a few things in my life that I haven't forgotten, um, but it's, it's, it's made me who I am. It's kind of shaped me and I'm, I'm tremendously, I'm the luckiest guy in the world to be doing this. I love it. It's not like a job to me. It can be draining at times. Mm -hmm. Uh, with just dealing with uh, personality and people, you know, and everybody's different. But you had two wins last night, and that was incredible. And it was really lovely to see how much joy you had in that moment. I, I feel like a lot of times people are so afraid to be joyful yeah. There's, because it's not cool or whatever it is, and it's men and women. I can care less. Life is so short in life those is, moments. It's like just... <laughs> Feel your joy, and, and it was that was really neat. To see. Life is short, and uh, you know I have children. I, I've never uh, that's never seen my parents. I talk about them often. My parents were wonderful people, William T. Dixon and Aline Dixon. They weren't my biological mother and father, but they were tremendous. They were great people, just good people, hardworking. Uh, just believed in karma if you do things right treat people right that's that's what you get and um, I'm very proud to to for some of the things I've done but I feel like my best work is still ahead I truly do and if if I'm blessed enough to continue to move my goal now in life I want to you know I want to accomplish a few things I want to win a couple of world titles um, I just feel like if if I'm producing winners, then my voice will get broader and um, I'll be able to go out and make a difference and really do some real work somewhere, you know? And that's, and, and I, I swear every morning when I wake up, that's it. There's no question I will, I feel, and you know, a lot of people go, well, that's arrogant, you shouldn't say that. Well, everything that I've said in life, I've, tr I've tried to accomplish it. Well, I have pretty much, 
because once I say it and you speak it every day, then you have something to do. I, I want to be a Hall of Fame coach, uh, and I want to be a, win world, world championships. And uh, but I am willing to pay the price. I'm willing to work extremely hard, mm -hmm. study, stay humble, grounded, and uh, I think. Once I do that, then again, I'll be able to, my best days are ahead. My best work will start then. So your son is undefeated, right? Yeah, Carlos Dixon. So how, how um, the kid that came to you and say, okay, I have a week, I'm going to pick boxing. How many years ago was that, first of all? Wow. He was 12. And how old is he now? 21. Okay. So does he ever stop in, in the awe of it and say, wow, like, Dad, you put me on this whole other. I think that uh, I think it will. He will. I think right now he's you know, twenty one years old. I know some people, listeners are going to hear this. <laughs> and you're you, At 21, you know, you know everything. <laughs> you, yeah, but you really, you know, there was somebody that said something to me once, and I have to share this. That goes to the twenty one years old. He used to say all the time to me, James, see what you look at. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? See what you look at. I thought he was crazy. And I'm like, all right, man. I kind of laughed. He goes, no, listen. I'll bet you, gentlemen's bet, but you have to be completely honest with me. We're going to bet. You're going to look me in the eyes. You're going you're gonna to tell me it's a $5 bet. Bet you five bucks. You're going to get in your car today. Do not turn on the radio. Just see what you look at. I guarantee you, you've been driving from the school home every day for how many years? Three years. You're going to see something today that you never seen on the way home. I bet you five bucks. I took his bet. I get in the car, don't turn on the radio, and I'm really just relaxed, and I'm seeing what I'm looking at. I seen, <laughs> I seen three or four things that I'd never seen in three years of driving up and down this road. I do that today. There's days I get in a car. I just don't turn nothing on and I just relax and I see what I look at. At 21, they're not seeing what they're looking at. You know? Mm -hmm. They're not slowing down enough. And now with the mind, now today it's a hustle bustle world. Hey, listeners, today, <laughs> when you get in your car, do not turn on until after you listen to us. <laughs> after you listen to us, turn everything off and see what you're looking at. And I promise you, you will see something that you haven't seen. You could have been driving this way four or five years. I do it every day. And it amazes me how fast life is going by. And when they say really smell the roses, a lot of people aren't. And you wouldn't think from a game of boxing, you know, it, 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 these guys are athletes. It's no different than NFL, NBA, baseball. That's one thing I'm going to change in a sport. These guys are not brutes. They're calculated. They're intelligent. And they are tough guys. When they say the sweet science, 80% of this game is mental. It's mental. Yeah, there's a lot of things going on. Range, timing, speed. The footwork is the most important thing to boxing. It's like a ballerina. She's to, like to, said last night. To be a great boxer, you have to have great feet. you got to have balance. Yeah. That way you can put your things together and have power. That's where the power comes from, from those great feet. Mm -hmm. So... There's, there's, there's nothing like what I do. I love it. Uh, there's so many coaches out there I admire and respect. And uh, who are some of your favorite boxers through time? My boxers now, wow. Um, and why? I, I like Mikey Garcia. I mean, I get bashed all the time. Mikey Garcia is a technical guy. He's tough. He's durable. He sets traps. Uh, I love Terrence Crawford. Terrence Crawford's a technical guy. He's from Omaha, Nebraska, small market town. Had to build himself there. I still think, you know, now he's pound for pound one of the greatest uh, uh, boxers. 
Roman Chinko. Roman Chico, just slick, power. I mean, wow, he's I like Roman Chinko. And all these guys are great. I mean, I can't just say there's one because styles make fights. And when you're a real boxing guy, you know, Roman Chinko is great. Mikey Garcia is great. Uh, Terrence Crawford is great. And then you have this guy down in Texas, Dallas, Errol Spence. Wow. He's power. I think he's the he's a superstar uh, now. Great boxer, southpaw. Uh, that means left-handed for people that don't. Yeah, yeah, that means left-handed. So when you, those, those guys there, but there's a lot of great fighters. But right now, I would have to say those guys are, those guys. And then when you go to the heavyweight, of course, Dante, the, the bomber from Alabama, Dante Wilder, he's heavyweight. And I think, no, we haven't even seen his best days yet. He's still, you know, he's still young. He's still, really, if you look at his amateur career and his pro career, I mean, uh, I think his best days are ahead as well. But you, you those, have Ali on your wall. Oh man, Muhammad Ali, Sugar Ray Robinson, uh, Joe Lewis. You know, you look at those guys. But Muhammad Ali, uh, I'll argue this to the grave. Uh, he was in his prime. He was, he was the greatest. Now, him and Sugar Ray Robinson. Sugar Ray Robinson. When you compare stats, Sugar Ray Robinson was just, I think. He is to me, and then Muhammad Ali for more than just boxing. Muhammad Ali was just not only a great champion in the ring, but he was a great champion out of the ring. I've, I've been around, and I've been fortunate and blessed to be around a lot of pro athletes around the world and different people. And I'll never forget at the uh, at Muhammad Ali's unity, his funeral, and Billy Crystal was talking about how. They were in a banquet in L.A. and you had, you know, some of the greats, Jim Brown and some of these great Abdul Dabar and all of these great athletes from basketball and football, Hall of Famers, were in a room. But setting up there, Muhammad Ali was like glowing. And all of these great athlete Hall of Famers were just staring. Like, I, I'll never forget him walking in here in Louisville we were at a concert one night and Muhammad Ali came in and he just walked in the floor and everybody stopped and stood and when you were around him it was uh, greatness when he passed away the funeral here in Louisville Kentucky there was a million people that came to town I mean think about this the Yum Center with the floor it seats night 19 there was like 18 or 17,000 tickets and they were gone in less than eight hours and then there was people on the roads on both sides I mean and I read an article and he was the most wrote about talked about person in Guinness's book of records other than Jesus Christ and here was two men who know their own hearts. Two men that knew their own hearts, and one that never wavered. Never ever. Even when he wasn't popular. That's right. When the country didn't like him. You know, and then you see how that turned around. When your heart is right, you're doing the right things, it comes in full circle. I tell these kids that. There's a, Muhammad Ali can be used as so many examples. Now he's going to beat a kid up for stealing his bike, a police officer, and today, think about, think about today, a police officer stopping a black kid today, they're scared, they're terrified. Police officer stopped him, take him took him to the boys club, taught him how to box. Yeah. They became one of the greatest athletes of all time. 21st century, he was the greatest athlete. And it all came from someone taking a bike, Want to beat him up, interaction with a police officer. <laughs> and here you have a guy that took that platform, took that platform and done more good with it 
than I think any other athlete in the 21st series. There's not even one close, mm-hmm. you know? And you have athletes today that would not dare, would not dare risk their money to speak up for anything or anybody. Yeah. Here's a man who won his first title, won his first title, and then took a seat. They basically stripped him for five years. Think about Michael Jordan. Think about Tom Brady winning their first championship and then setting them down for five years. They gonna come back and win two more? Probably not. They probably won't come back at all. And this guy came back as a prize fighter with young guys that are in there, younger guys. In boxing, there's no off season. Boxing is the only sport there's no off season. You need to think about George Foreman. People could say, I know some listeners that may know some boxing and say, well, George Foreman done it. Yeah, George Foreman done it, and he quit in his prime. He didn't take no damage when he was fighting, and he was able to do that. Every time a prize fighter goes in a ring, he leaves a little bit in there for our entertainment. Every time. You know, uh, it's... uh, What do you mean by that? Because it's tough. I mean, it's a tough game. It's, it's, it's real. These guys are getting hit. These guys, the object is to hit and not be hit. But you got to think. I mean, people say, well, it's barbaric. It's, uh, it's, why do you do it? Well, you can go back Forever. to the beginning of time. There was <laughs> Roman Colosseums. That's Men's right. been competing against one another, and that's just something that they do. Yeah, the gladiators. <laughs> you go. Well, I didn't know. I was going to walk in. I was going to, like, turn off the thing again. Yeah, so they've just been competing. Men compete. That's just what they do. Mm-hmm. And it's something in And all those sports are gladiator sports, technically. They all yeah. are. Every single one. Absolutely. Including the female sports. Anytime you pit people against each other. Combat. You, yeah, it's combat. Yes. I love it, though. And um, I think uh, when they say it's the sweet science, it truly is because... You have two athletes that have been training to, you know, to mustered up enough energy to take the other man to the deck, and uh, you're both getting tired. You're both hard. You know, you're hot, and it's mine. It's that's the eighty percent mental that comes in. Watching those guys, all of them, and the women, the two women. Oh, the women are night. awesome. The women they, are great. Oh, man. I, and I actually said, I was like, these women are, it seems like they're working even harder. than. But, I mean, you could see on their faces, they're so tired. And they just keep going. There's, I have so much respect hustling, for that. Hustling. Oh, my God. Hustling. How that's just even, they just keep pushing. It's like the It's like distance. life, right? Yeah, I mean. If you. You, some, sometimes we get up and go to work sick, right? Yeah. We have to go, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's something in people. You have to... I, I, got, I went to work and I haven't felt well. That's what separates some people with winning and losing. You just don't give up. People's, people's doing it right now. That's listening to us. They're having a bad day. Things are hitting them, but they're, they're hustling on. It's the same thing. That's what I'm saying about this game that's so much like life. And you can see the tide turn. You can see a guy almost down off his feet or a young lady. And then the next round, she's back. And now she's back on top. And you can just see it going both ways. That's life. But when with a real, real good boxer and an elite boxer, no matter whether he's up or down, he always stays even keel. And he stays to the course. He stays to the game plan. That's what separates world champions, Hall of Famers, from good fighters. There's a lot of good fighters, and there's a lot of great fighters. Great fighters, but they're not world champions. To be a world champion and then to maintain it for a few years. Or several titles. When like everybody's <laughs> gunning for you, yeah. then that just lets you know that's, uh, that's special. I mean, that's special. And then there's... There's folks that's doing it every day in life. They're out there. Things are hitting them. Things are coming at them. They just keep hustling. They keep digging. They keep finding a way to win. Yeah. You have no choice. Do you worry at all for your son um, with the, the people talking about the brain injuries and such? Yeah, of course I do. I worry that uh, I worry about him going out uh, with his friends on a weekend and having a car accident. One of them, you know, we're, we were all young, you know. 
Mm-hmm. I worry about that more than I do uh, boxing. Mm-hmm. I asked Steve Andrew that same question, and he said nearly the exact same answer. Absolutely. Yeah. Life is life. I mean, you know, we got to leave here. We got to get in a car, but we put a safety belt on. Well, as coaches, we have owe our kids a God-given right to know our business, to teach the guys really how to roll a punch. Do you, do you say, like, these are all the risks and all this stuff, and everybody Absolutely. has a choice? Everybody has a choice, and there are risks. And a lot of people take three drinks and go drive, which is arguably way more dangerous. Way more dangerous. Absolutely. And think, you know, oh, I'm fine. Right. I've, I've known a lot of boxers, and I know more friends that's been killed by drunk drivers than I have that's been killed in a ring boxing. You know, mm-hmm. that's just statistics don't lie. I mean, boxing has been going on forever, and yes, yes, you can be hurt seriously, and you can be killed in a ring. You can. It's happened. But the odds of it happening is like getting on Delta and flying from New York to California. The risk is there, but you get on the plane, you don't think much of it. Boxers do the same thing when they lace up gloves. There's a risk, but we're going to get in the ring, right. and we're going to uh, be as safe as possible. We're going to fasten our safety belts, mm-hmm. you know, and that's the same thing. We're going to teach, I teach my son how to slip, roll punches. He's young enough. If we do this sport right, just like any other athlete, we do it right, we go in, we do well, we accomplish what we want, and then we go sit down. Everybody has their time, you know? Mm. You're not getting younger, you know, you get older. I am. Day. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Me too. We're drinking the same water. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's, how, that's how we approach it. I mean, you cannot approach things that you're going to get hit. There's motocross, guys that oh, ride on motocross. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of extreme things, but... I know uh, actually a handful of people that have had their children die on ATV, on vacationing, on yeah. accidents on ATVs. Yeah. And it's, I think if you're passionate about something, yeah. then, and I said this on another interview over the last, over this weekend, because the passion is so obvious in, in everyone that is in that ring. Yes. Even, honestly, even the people, because there's always a winner and a loser, and even just seeing how graceful people were in that moment, too. No, afterwards, I mean, look, we've been on the short end. We've fought the amateurs, and we've lost 16, 17 times, 17 times. And, hey, man, you respect that guy. Any guy or, or girl or female that gets in a ring and puts it on the line, I mean, we, look, it's a brotherhood. We respect them. I mean, we have nothing but respect for them. The courage to get in there and do it to compete. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's nothing but respect. Yeah, and I think that's a huge lesson. Again, yeah. here's an opponent. That's that just in order to understand your opponent, you have to respect them. Absolutely. That's the only way you ever understand anyone. That's right, and we, you don't start off trying to bulldog him. You have to go out there very respectful and work your game plan. Yeah. You know, because if you go in too careless, then you can the same thing can happen to you. You know, you can be knocked out. You know? Is it hard for right-handers to fight southpaws? Is that, or is it pretty much the same? Doesn't matter. I mean, you know, the southpaws are, can be difficult, a little difficult at times. You know, uh, because they're used to, uh, you're used to the right hand, the lead hand coming to you at a different angle. But uh, no, I mean. Just throw a lead right hand. You just throw a right hand with south paws and left hook and try to keep your foot on the outside of his to keep his left hand off the line with your head. So <laughs> <laughs> if you do that, you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. So you just said bringing it back. I would think that this would be the mothership of uh, boxing, considering. Well, we took an absent of boxing for about 30 plus years here, about 30 years. Um, You've just had the wrong people in it, uh, turning kids pro too young, not enough experience. Uh, uh, there's not been a surge in boxing here in quite some time, but, but we're kind of. This has a big legacy here. Oh man, we've had we we're with the home of the greatest Muhammad Ali, but we've had four four world champions in Louisville, Kentucky. I mean Marvin Hart, Muhammad Ali, Jimmy Ellis, and Greg Page. 
uh, from 1925 to the last one, 1984. So, yes, we've had a rich history. There was, if you go back to the 20th, uh, to the early 1900s, there was probably 30 gyms in Louisville. I mean, this is a place Joe Lewis used to come and have fun. Seriously, Louisville, Kentucky. You wouldn't think that, but... Uh, now today with Louisville's top-notch boxing or Louisville TKO boxing, we've, we've got probably seven, seven active gyms here in Louisville and boxing's picked up. I'm proud of it. A lot of good boxing in the region. You got St. Louis up the road, Indianapolis, Cincinnati. So there's a lot of good talent. You know, in Chicago and Cleveland, Toledo, they're all right here in this region. Not going to leave out Nashville or Knoxville, but... Uh, we have, we have a lot of good talent here. We've been overlooked because our fighters in the Midwest, had, we just haven't had the work, been as busy as the kids on the East and the West Coast because there's more gyms, there's more promoters, so they get more work and you can move them along faster to get opportunities. But um, we've, we, we're, we're moving forward, we're building it back and uh, trying to keep the great Muhammad Ali and Greg Page, Jimmy Ellis, and Marvin Hart, all of the legacy alive, and build future world champions. And helping kids. Helping kids, that's the most important thing. Keeping kids off the street and uh, making champions in and out of the ring. Uh, every kid that comes in my gym, I tell them every day, they're, every one of them's not gonna be an Olympian. Every one of them's not gonna sign a contract and be a professional fighter. But you can't be productive in life and you can uh, win in life, you know, and, and make a change and make a difference in someone else's life. So if they teach or if I can teach them that and they can learn and go out and teach that to, you, to others, then, man, I've won. Yeah. Thanks, James. Thank you very much. This is really great. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to all your listeners, and um, I'm looking forward to seeing you again soon. Yeah. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Hey, thanks for listening. Rate and review Hey Human on iTunes. Thank you. Bye.